This content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained on here constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by Draper Gorin Home LLC or any third party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments whatsoever. Cheers. 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 <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, as everybody else, as you're coming in, please feel free to uh, ask any questions in the Q&A. And uh, uh, Adam, do you want to take it away or should we just start going through some uh, introductions? Let's start with introductions. Let's do that. I guess we can start with Amy and then work our way through Richard and, and Shay. All cool. right. Awesome. So, hi, everybody. My name is Amy. <laughs> I am the CEO of Bling, otherwise known as Bling Financial. Our website is blingfi.com. And I also happen to be a former, or I guess still current attorney. I just don't practice very much anymore. Um, and our, our uh, company is actually in the crypto gaming space. Not, not quite blockchain gaming, um, except for the fact that uh, our games do reward users in Bitcoin, which is on the blockchain. So there is some some relatedness. Um, but we we put our first game out about 14 months ago, and now we have over 2.25 million users, and it's just gone bonkers with COVID, and we're growing every day. So if any of you guys like you know, games like, you know, uh, Candy Crush, Toon Blast, Knife Hit, or Solitaire. We have games in those categories on the Google Play Store. Cool. That's awesome. Nice. Richard, take it away. Hi, guys. I'm Richard Bocklington. Uh, I started my, um, this phase of my career as, an, as a cultural anthropologist. My first papers uh, studying the internet are from 96 which was before HTTP was even popular. We were studying NNTP at that time at the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. Um, I, I've worked in a bunch of different uh, gaming auspices uh, from Dungeons and Dragons to um, Transformers. And uh, most recently I, I left Hasbro to what was called Backflip Studios at the time, uh, making mobile games uh, to join Backflip Studios uh, where I worked on a bunch of products uh, especially at CryptoKitties, which some of you may know uh, in the crypto space. Super happy to talk to you about gaming and blockchain. I have a very long history in uh, gaming and uh, only a moderate history in blockchain, where at the end of my time at Stanford, these guys are bugging me about blockchain. I was like, hmm, could it hurt if I just take everything that's left in my bank account that I'm never going to use again and put it on the internet? Because taking a small amount of money and connecting to the internet seemed like a bad idea. And so I made what was that, in respect, the right choice and put all my remaining money into Bitcoins quite a while ago. Nice. To the moon. And, and by the way, Amy, I forgot to ask you, what are you drinking? Today I am drinking a cab that happened to be open. Um, we've been, cool. the alcohol consumption in our house during COVID-19 has definitely gone up a lot. So this is a recently opened bottle. Nice. And Richard, what are you drinking? I'm drinking my favorite drink, which is an Amaro. Uh, that is Fernet. This specific is a Fernet Branca, which is a very bitter, dark, high alcohol spirit uh, that's good to settle your stomach. Uh, wow. I got really interested in Fernet after I contracted uh, typhoid fever from a friend returning from Syria many years ago. And I can say this is delicious. And also it really, it does settle your stomach. Wow. Interesting, I gotta find that somewhere. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Shay, last but not least, take yes. it away. I am Shane Newkirk. I'm also known as Crypto Stash amongst the greater crypto community or just stashed my friends. Uh, I have been in blockchain and Bitcoin since 2013-ish. Uh, I have also been a gamer my entire life. And so I kind of hit that intersection of blockchain and gaming here, uh, you know, quite a few a year, a year or two ago. Uh, kind of really combining both of my loves there. You know, I've been doing streaming uh, online for quite some time, but, you know, being able to really find this great estuary of where blockchain meets gaming and where I really see that kind of future going 
uh, is what I kind of focus on now. Uh, but I have a really popular website where I do help uh, beginners learn and uh, you know grow uh, in the cryptocurrency space. So I love helping uh, people kind of learn about this in general and uh, really excited about where blockchain gaming is going here in the future and, and things like play to earn and, and ways that people can actually uh, you know retain value through through games versus how the traditional model kind of is now. Cool. And, and what are you drinking? Uh, I am drinking a very fine IPA from Stone Brewing. This is a limited edition. It looks weird. It's upside down, right? It's supposed to be like that, but anyways. Does it, does it come upside down? Uh, yeah, this one is, a, like I said, this is a limited edition, so the label okay. is specifically put upside down. Cool. It's telling you to drink it faster so you could read the label. <laughs> exactly. That's all I should <laughs> are, are you in Southern California, Shane? Oh, I am. I'm in Long Beach. Long Beach, California. Because the brew, the, the stone brewery uh, on the water near San Diego is one of the most beautiful places I've explored. Yeah, yes, yeah. so, uh, it's it's a, it's one of my favorite breweries. Uh, yeah, Stone's based in San Diego, so it, they're you know they're a larger micro brew, but you know definitely one of the most popular ones here in California. Shay, I can't believe I don't know you. I live in Long Beach. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. What? I, I I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know there were many uh, crypto blockchain people in Long Beach where uh, we got a meet up or, you know, socially distance meet up sometime or something. Uh, yeah, you know, we actually run a blockchain, a, a Bitcoin meetup. I've been running a Bitcoin meetup here in Long Beach for three years. I don't know where you've been, but you should come to one. Obviously, you can't come now. We do virtual ones and we're doing one this Thursday. So I can put some info about that. Yeah, send me the details. It's because I always have to drive up to L.A. to go to a lawns events. <laughs> There you go. Well, there's a lot of good stuff going on in Long Beach, so. Yeah. I like the other side of the continent here, just outside of Toronto, Canada. And yet, <laughs> according not what you've heard on the internet, Toronto is in Canada. I swear. <laughs> we have a primary source here. <laughs> I actually had a conversation the other day uh, about Delaware, and I'm not 100% sure it actually exists in real life. <laughs> Prove me wrong. Is I work here? for people who said they were from Rhode Island, but they never <laughs> let me come visit them. Not even once. Okay, Delaware has to exist because that's where everyone sets up their corporations to avoid. Exactly. So <laughs> exactly. I'm assuming it's real. Totally. I assumed it was real until somebody asked me that the other day, and then I have driven through Delaware. There is not much to see. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you go through Delaware, Amy, you go from where to where. You just, you just drive through it. I think I had, you know, what it was is we were on our way back from a wedding and we stayed one night in Wilmington and I was just interested because, you know, like as an attorney, I formed so many companies in Delaware. I was like, so what's there, you know, like, is it like all these courthouses? No, it's just, it's just like, it looks like suburbia. Oh, nice. Okay. I don't. I, I don't know if that would be like the biggest bummer of all times to expect to see a million courthouses and actually find them there. <laughs> uh, Disappointing. <laughs> hold on a second. Craig just sent me a message. Um, give me just a minute. I'm going to try to re-invite him and get him on. Um, but I guess, I guess I'll start off. Start us off with the first question. I mean, considering this is. And the whole topic is what goes into creating blockchain based games, right? I'm selfishly interested, right? How do you even create a blockchain based game? Do you just create the game itself as you normally would for any other non blockchain based game and then attach the trading NFT components to it? Or how, how does it exactly work? I can, so we can start with Richard, Amy, anybody that just wants to dive in, go for it. You're shaking his head. You should go first. Yeah, Richard feels it. So, Nowadays, almost every game is has learned from role-playing games. Uh, I used to work on Dungeons and Dragons. That, that's probably my favorite game. Uh, is D&D still, uh, 40 years later. Uh, and Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games in general are all about progression and rewards. As you play, you, you get some stuff. So Amy mentioned some top tier like Candy Crush and so on. And again, the world we're in, as you play, you get some stuff. And so... When I make a game for you on mobile that's just in the app store that is not connected to blockchain, you never actually earn any stuff. You get some stuff, but it always stays on, I tell these guys, like set up the server, like 
it stays on our server and you have, you have some stuff. The fundamental difference between blockchain gaming and, and regular gaming to me is that once you get your stuff, then it's actually yours. And like any other type of your stuff, you can do with it as you see fit. And so this fundamentally changes the economy of the game. Now, the inner loop, like what you're actually doing, might be similar, but the economic repercussions of your gameplay activity, those are fundamentally different. And so when we're designing a blockchain game, first of all, we need to understand that what you win in the game and what you earn in the game, you can take with you, sell, give away, inherit, whatever you like. But also, as we're designing that economy, you might bring things from other places in. So fundamentally, it's an open economy rather than the closed model economy that a, that a normal game might be. And thus, the rewards you get in a blockchain game are real, where the war rewards you get in any other game that is not connected to blockchain are fundamentally ephemeral and controlled by the, the game master. Got you. So does that mean so existing games like, I don't know, Call of Duty or previously RuneScape, right? Could they integrate the blockchain component just like that? Or would they need to restructure their whole entire architecture and whatnot? Modern games have two layers. There is the core loop and then there is the outer loop. And thus, if a, a, a given existing game wanted to integrate with the blockchain, they would need to rethink their outer loop. The core loop doesn't necessarily need to change, like what's happening in terms of the, the micro gameplay, what happens in a session. But fundamentally, the rewards that you gain and how you can spend things in the game, you, you have to rethink that entire system to allow an open economy rather than to use a closed model economy that, that is completely within the control of the game master. Got you. Got you. Just want to take it off topic because Craig managed to join us. How's it going, Craig? Sorry about all those technical difficulties. Wait, we can't hear you. So all is good, no worries. You got to put the microphone down to your face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh no, we can't hear you. No worries. <laughs> we'll, we can come back. Try if it doesn't work. Try refreshing your your uh, your browser or your the tab too. Boom. Cool. Anybody else want to add to that last point, Shay or Amy? When it comes to actually creating blockchain-based games, right? What what necessarily goes into it? Whether it be modern games, I also see in the in the comments right now someone's talking about how games still need to be hosted on local service, but the efficiency of, of the assets, right, could be transferable on blockchain. Feel free to touch up on that. So I want to even take it a couple steps back um, okay. and pose the question of when should you add a blockchain to a game, right? Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of enthusiasm for, oh my gosh, let's add blockchain to, you know, 2017 is like, oh, let's add blockchain to everything. Now in 2020, it's, oh, let's add blockchain to every game. And it doesn't always make sense. Like there are certain things where, you know, it, it certainly makes a lot more sense, anything that's collectible. So you're thinking like card games, um, you know, like sports cards, things like that. Um, I've had people come and ask us before, hey, um, are you going to add blockchain to your games? And our reply is, well, we make mobile casual and hyper casual games and there really isn't a reason for us to add blockchain right now like there there has to be a, a good reason you add blockchain because it does add cost and security issues and things like that so there has to be some benefit and i think someone mentioned this you know a couple minutes ago but um i also think that to the extent it's not like a pure collectibles thing but it's it's actually a game uh you know, I think game developers spend a lot of time designing um, a certain type of ecosystem, if you will. And so there's there's currently a lot of talk about, oh, we'll take these cards in game A and then we'll use them in game B. And um, I feel like the discourse around that needs to be more nuanced because if you just take a card from game A and plop it into B, 
game B, it may ruin game B, right? So it has to be, all this has to be very carefully done. Okay, interesting. Craig, can, let's try yeah, Can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you. Uh, there we go. That was, that was a fun oh. 20 minutes. Cheers. <laughs> let's cheers really quick. What are you drinking? Uh, I've got a, a vodka Coke here. Okay. It's a nice. departure from my rum and Coke, but yeah, yeah. here we are. Cheers. 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 Go ahead and introduce yourself just for, sure. for joining in and uh, we'll get back to it. Yeah, yeah so um, I'm with Polyant Games, uh, which is the first investment firm that's wholly focused on NFTs and blockchain gaming. Uh, so a uh, couple with Polyant Labs, which is an early stage uh, blockchain startup incubator. Uh, we're really uh, leaning into the space and, you know, I uh, are, are particularly interested in the NFT asset class and a lot of the unique application layers that you can build on top of it. Um, yeah, but overall, you know, uh, hopefully my, uh, my inability to get into a simple web webcam, uh, chat doesn't uh, speak volumes about my, uh, technical abilities, but, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> no, no, all is good. It happens a lot. Sometimes we encounter technical difficulties ourselves. No worries, but thanks for joining us. It's, it's better. You make yourself feel better because you couldn't get on today for the first 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. Thanks for joining us, Craig. Can yeah, you tell us more about uh, before we we go back to to the gaming conversation? I'm I'm interested to learn more about um, about Polyan. Um, yeah, and, yeah, for and, sure. Uh, you know, just can you tell us more about at a high level when you say invest in blockchain games and uh, NFTs right. and stuff? Are you purchasing like NFT artwork to sell later right, at a right. premium or yeah. investing in the companies building this stuff? So so we're particularly interested in the, the startups that are developing the underlying infrastructure layer. Um, Cause you know, as everyone here knows right now, it's, it's very early days um, from, you know, everything from the, the pain points that we're feeling wash over from the DeFi space on Ethereum to, uh, you know, just the general scalability of things like minting transfers uh, you know, uh, integration into games, Web 3.0 wallets, everything that goes into this it just makes this, you know, uh, uh, you know, a consumer's nightmare, essentially. Uh, and so we're very much interested in investing in startups that are tackling these core issues, uh, both from, you know, the underlying infrastructure, as I mentioned, uh, minting marketplaces, uh, you know, what have you. Uh, but and then we're also extending into select application layers, like we made an investment into Blockade Games, the uh, team behind Neon District and upcoming MMO. And so it's a, uh, um, yeah, really an approach that, you know, we're, we're really interested in, in, in tackling both ends of the spectrum to help drive forward the, the industry as a whole. And, and as I mentioned, we're very much interested in uh, um, the, the application layers that can, can emerge for the NFT asset class that right now are, are currently hindered. And so uh, we have our investment arm and then we have our ecosystem arm. And so our ecosystem is really our approach to kind of like pull up our sleeves and, and work with the teams and really understand the needs in the space. Because I think a lot of uh, VCs in, in crypto and blockchain specifically, uh, we saw it in 2017, you know, they, they, they make these investments without truly understanding, uh, you know, kind of the, the full scope of what needs to be done. And so with our ecosystem, we're inviting major blockchain games, technical partners, uh, and, and a number of different groups. Like we have Chainlink, Maker, like seven or eight major blockchain games in the space now uh, within our ecosystem. And, and around that, we're, we're really helping facilitate NFT transactions, uh, user adoption. Fragmentation is a huge issue in the space, especially across networks. Uh, so looking at interoperability. Uh, and so, um, you know, through this ecosystem and investment approach, you know, we think that we found a good uh, combination that we, you know, can really help uh, push the uh, uh, asset class and uh, blockchain gaming industry forward. That's super cool. So, um, so cool. I mean, uh, I would love to hop back into uh, uh, questions and things like that. Shay, you've you've probably at least through your videos and things, I'm the most familiar with you doing this. So you've probably played the most amount of these games and received and played with the most amount of collectibles um, and things like that. Um, what do you see um, as the, uh, and, and Craig probably has seen this from looking at companies from the investor side and Richard has created games like this and Amy lets you win the rewards like this. So I think there's, there's a, it, it spiders out to everyone, but what have you seen as the best combination of um, like blockchain rewards or NFTs within a game being able to 
interoperably play with other games. I think you mentioned in the past that that engine uh, has has a way to do this pretty easily. But what is the best example of like winning a sword in some game and then taking it to another game and using it or, or doing something like that, that that you could give us as an example so we can all try and play with it? Uh, yeah, so um, I play a ton of these games, and I've been in the ecosystem with most of the gaming projects that are fairly prominent right now uh, for quite some time. Uh, I would say, you know, when it comes to what you're kind of talking about, which is this kind of, you know, Ready Player One Oasis style uh, of multiverse, uh, you know, Engine is definitely leading the way with that. Uh, they have a really robust ecosystem they've built out here over the last couple of years. And, you know, that's kind of one of the main tenets of what they, they kind of you know, provide there. Uh, on their base layer engine is uh, they, they provide kind of the tools for developers to quickly incorporate blockchain game uh, elements into their game. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think that they definitely, out of everything we've seen, has they, they have a, a, a quite a head start on, on a lot of these other blockchains with doing this. And they've already created a lot of items and uh, that are considered multiverse items, and they're used in multiple games right now. So I can go take one of my multiverse items, and I can use it in uh, a Minecraft server that's blockchain enabled, or I could use it in a dungeon crawler uh, called Lost Relics, or I could use it, um, you know, in uh, uh, multiple other games. And so they've really laid the foundation for that, and I think that's what we're talking about uh, is, is the other side here. So. We're talking about, well, what, what does blockchain really bring to gaming and why would you actually need it for a game? Because that's always one of the questions that we have here just in general in cryptocurrency is, well, why, why add a blockchain to it? You know, everyone's just like, oh, I'll throw a blockchain on it. We'll, we'll boost our stock 10%. Uh, and that kind of has worked for some people. 25. 25. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> but, you know, in general, I think that it works really well with, with gaming because there's a couple of things within gaming that people really rely on. Uh, even in traditional gaming, is rarity. People want to know that something is rare. I got this legendary gun skin while playing this tournament that only five people have. Well, I mean, if you're playing, a, you know, Fortnite or something or some sort of centralized game, uh, you know, they can say that it is, and maybe it is in their database, a one and a zero somewhere next to that, but you can't verify it. And, you know, in the, most of those games, you can't trade it or sell it or, or whatever it may be. But, you know, in ecosystems like what engine is building, you know, these things have a verifiable rare, you know, element to them. So you know for sure how many are out there and that helps to, you know, solidify its value in these secondary markets. But uh, with, with engine, they, you, each one of these NFTs that is minted for these games actually has a portion or, you know, maybe sometimes hundreds or thousands of engine coin that back that actual asset. So when you talk about something have a, having a default value outside of the game, uh, that's kind of what an engine has done effectively here. So, uh, you know, something may be backed by one engine coin, which obviously would fluctuate with the market of what its actual value is, but it gives it an intrinsic value outside of the market versus what it could be in game. I have tokens. Is that, is that up to the person who created the art to attack yeah. engine coins? So yes. it's like the artist would would put in like a hundred dollars onto their own piece of art to make it worth a hundred bucks or, or, or something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, it would be all crypto based. So, you know, I could put in a hundred dollars worth of engine coin at that time. And, you know, it's always going to be worth, you know, that many engine. And so the, you know, obviously the price will fluctuate, but you know, I, I have tokens where, you know, the price of it actually is only backed with maybe one engine, but it actually has way more intrinsic value because of what it is inside the game. And so then there's that aspect too. So, a, you know, blockchain gives us, you know, verifiable rare ability, like rareness to an item and the fact that, it, you know, it can be actually backed by some of these things. And so when you have these assets, you know, you can take them from game to game. Uh, yeah, that's one of the tokens I created. Yeah. This one is invaluable. It couldn't give it me enough to get so, rid of. Yeah, so I, I've been creating uh, my own NFTs on the engine platform. I was actually the first content creator that ever had an NFT created for them ever. Nice. Yeah. I can, and, and that's, and that is verifiable. <laughs> what? So, yeah. So, I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, these, uh, uh, one of the great, uh, you know, aspects of that is that within the engine ecosystem, you can take items from game to game, not every item, but you can designate items to be able to do that. And you, and you see that, uh, when we we're talking about, uh, I think Amy was talking about earlier, how, uh, you know, one item may not work as well or, or translate exactly to the other game because it may wreck the economy or something like that. Uh, you know, 
the great way they do this is each game kind of decides how that is incorporated. So in an RPG, it may be an actual axe that you wield and smash people on. In a card game, it may be an axe card that does something specific for that game. Uh, and so you have these items you can take game to game to game uh, that may have a different use case or purpose in the game. But the, ori yeah, the original game creator sets their own supply and all that. So it's not like if I make an axe in my game, Adam can make more axes in his game to make it no, easier. It, it yeah, it's all, it's all based upon that original yeah. asset. That's really cool. Interesting. So you guys make it sound so colorful and grandiose, but clearly there's a lot of challenges with creating stuff like this, right? For example, like like network challenges in general, transaction speed, right? Yeah. Running, a, running a game on Ethereum, and I'm sure Richard, CryptoKitties has clearly experienced this, and it's been like, uh, I've read about it publicly, and, and you guys are actually approaching this issue by starting your own blockchain, right? It's, it's called Flow Blockchain. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. So most of that, I want to support everything that has been said. The issue that we encountered with CryptoKitties is that as soon as we built a, a crypto game that had any measure of real consumer uptake, we immediately broke Ethereum. And so, first of all, that was awesome. That's amazing. All, that completely sucked. And so that's kind of like, you know, I love technology. I continue to invest in new and different and interesting technologies because that's the sweet spot. It's awesome and it sucked. And so what we recognized from the success of CryptoKitties was that a successful crypto game was enough to just destroy the platform. And so uh, we have spent a couple years now working hard to bring forth the Flow blockchain and it is meant Primarily, just it, it, we love Ethereum. We think Ethereum is full of great ideas, and I love to explain to the, the crypto noob like, what what's Ethereum? Is that like Bitcoin? Blah blah blah. And I try to explain that there are many things like Bitcoin. They are all different types of propeller airplane. But once you decide to put your money on the blockchain, then the question is, why don't you just start putting computer programs inside the money, and that's Ethereum. And now we have jet planes. So that helps people understand the, the transformation that Ethereum is fundamentally way more powerful than Litecoin or Ripple or any of these other, you know, basically financial derivatives of blockchain, which are great. And I love the idea that the software can fork and you can have all sorts of different variants. I do remember having not paid attention to my Bitcoin for a while, that there was a fork and I was like, oh my God, Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, which one do I have? And I looked, and I was like, oh shit. If you buy before the fork, you have both in equal measure. That is a nice property of the blockchain and an encouragement to invest early in these things because once the chain forks, you have both. Now, we have designed the Flow blockchain uh, to solve the problems that we encountered with the first really successful consumer application that was non-financial in the blockchain, CryptoKitties. And uh, we made a blockchain that has some really interesting properties. So for example, most blockchain software, everything happens on one computer and like all the computers are more or less equivalent. And so we relax that assumption and a flow node does one of four jobs. So we just took what has to happen for the blockchain and divided it into four different types of tasks. So you can run an execution node or maybe you don't want to. Execution node is the most processor intensive. And what this allowed us to do was to build a blockchain that is approximately three orders of magnitude faster, and for my pur which is good, but for my purposes as a game designer, three orders of magnitude cheaper than Ethereum. So right now, I, I love God's Own Chain. I particularly love Skyweaver, uh, and I like collectible card games. And so the problem we're having on Ethereum right now is that as decentralized finance takes off, it becomes like really useful. And that's why, I mean, Ethereum is, is at a year line all time high right now, which is awesome. But it means that if I want to buy a CryptoKitty or breed a CryptoKitty or trade a God's Unchained card, I got to be willing to pay like two, three bucks for the transaction for the gas. And let me tell you, having worked on game design for a really long time, adding a $2 transaction fee to a collectible card game 
well, that, that is the end of that game. Because collectible cards, the vast majority of them have a median value less than $2. And so if you want to add 100% tax on everything, that can work. But anybody who has spent any time studying economics understands that 100% tax in general destroys most industries. And thus, you need to work towards making the consumer have the option to do the transactions with a fee that supports the ecosystem that they're in, but it's not burdensome on the consumer or else the consumer will, will yeah. leave. Because nobody's being forced to put, there's no socialist government making you play Bitcoin games. You've got to choose to do it. And so we live in, a, in, a, in an economy where those, those prices are real. And thus, by, if I'm going to pay two bucks to trade, trade a card, I'm probably not going to do it. 20 cents? Makes 20 cents maybe? Two cents? Oh, yeah. 0. 0.2 cents? Money. Yeah. And the yeah. whole blockchain aims to reduce the cost of blockchain gaming by three orders of magnitude, as well as accelerate the speed. Now, the speed is a whole, in terms of game design, the speed is a different issue, but I can kind of solve the speed program with like lots of other mechanics. Like I can give you timers and make you think that in order to do this action, minimum six minutes. Mm -hmm. And there are certain types of games, I mean, I can't get you to play Call of Duty when it takes six minutes to do an action because bullets fly faster than six minutes. Right. Hearthstone-like, or, or, or other games that have an outer loop that's kind of paced, turn-based stuff, yeah, two, three, four, five, six minutes, that's okay. But I can't solve that money problem outside. So the money problem, as well as the time problem, are super big problems for Ethereum. And the unfortunate thing is, as Ethereum becomes more loved and more wanted because of its use in decentralized finance, you, as a gamer, need to compete with that guy who's doing like a substantial trade. He doesn't give a damn on his $16,000 trade that there's a $2 fee. That is not really relevant to him. You just want to charge. Yeah. So the, two, the, the fact that the fee went from 14 cents to $2.66, that's a huge problem. Yeah. And the flow, the amount amount of time. The flow basically aims to just solve that problem for you by yeah. vastly reducing the cost of transaction and for game designers also significantly increasing the speed of the transaction, which is like an awesome benefit that allows us to explore game types that might not have been viable. But really it's 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 the cost for transaction change that, right. that to me is like, oh my God, this is now blue ocean. Exactly. Yeah, I think I live I live in the fintech space all the time and people constantly uh, uh, worried about fees you know, reminds me that it's really not ready for consumer adoption on the on the financial side. It never was really meant to, in my opinion, you know, because people will build products on top of it. And those, you know, they could batch transactions, they could figure out how to keep those costs down. But if I think back to being a kid and trading baseball cards or, or comic book cards and magic cards, I would trade cards all the time with my friends in their garages, at their houses, at the comic book shop. But I would probably never do a trade if it's like, Shay's going to give me this card, I'm going to give them this card, and then we each have to put in $2. Like, that would have never happened because $2 were a pack of cards or a comic book or something like that. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Maybe to add uh, something to that, yeah. So on the topic of transaction fees, um, because we pay people out in Bitcoin, and essentially we do a lot of micropayments. I mean, you could play our game for like, five, 10 minutes and, you know, cash out like fractions of a penny, right? Um, and so we've had a lot of users write into us being like, hey, I want to be able to cash out to my wallet. But the problem is with micropayments, if, you, if, if we let you cash out to your wallet, by the time you get something, there will be nothing from the transaction fees, right? And so the way we found around this was by cashing people out to Coinbase, which I know is not people's favorite thing sometimes, but you know what? If it's an off-chain transaction, it's free. And the number of transactions we do every hour is, it, it's pretty insane. I mean, we have over 2 million users, right? And so, you know, for us doing on-chain transactions, like our with our rewarded app and the fact that we do primarily micropayments, it just doesn't work. 
We got to talk that is a thousand times cheaper. What you could do. Think about what you could do if things, if those payments were 1,000 times. Oh yeah, I mean, here's the interesting thing. If you look at the landscape today of other rewarded games, like there, people do the same type of games, but with cash, like with US dollars as rewards instead of Bitcoin, right? And the interesting thing about that is they make you, it's kind of scammy actually, they make you play until you earn 10, $40 before you cash out, but they make it, almost impossible for you to earn that 10 to $40. So A, they're making the arbitrage, but B, it's because the way they cash you out is through PayPal usually, which charges a huge transaction fee. And so whereas most rewarded apps um, in the cash space, uh, they, they'll usually have like one big winner and then like almost no like little winners of like, you know, the, the small amounts that you make for us, we're able to make it much more democratic because we actually pay everybody. Hmm. And it's because of transaction fee. Yeah. And, and, and I thought that was great, actually. I stayed up one night and I think it took me like two days to earn enough to, to um, get it. And I was, my mind was blown at how quickly and well it worked into, into Coinbase. Um, and so that was great. Actually, one of the reasons I got into crypto was because we would be building crowdfunding sites and things like that and we couldn't send small payments because the payments would cost a buck or two just to pay for for visa and paypal and crap like that and now we're getting into that territory with crypto which is which is a bummer um but i think jay we had a bunch of questions and things in the chat in the chat um and uh shay you wanted to touch on um some of the scaling solutions and some of the things like wax which it sounds like um, is going the direction of, of what Flow is doing. And I bet Craig, you you probably are looking into this a lot. I'm assuming every one of your portfolio companies dealing with this on a major level. Uh, yeah, so I mean, um, when, you, when you talk about transaction fee scaling solutions, Bitcoin, Lightning Network, I don't know if you guys are using Lightning for your app, but I mean, that's that's what you sh probably should look into for, for micropayments. It's, yeah, it's horrible if you're just using BTC on-chain transactions, um, you know, with, if in the current situation it is right now, obviously with this explosion of DeFi, we've seen you know gas fees go incredibly high. I haven't been doing anything on, on Ethereum, including playing or trading gods and chain cards, which I used to do quite often. Uh, so you know everyone who has built things on, on Ethereum is all in the same boat, and some of these larger companies are actually working on their own solutions. So uh, Engine is working on what they call Efinity, which is a scaling solution for Ethereum. And it's going to be able to, it's, it's obviously specifically aimed at games and, you know, the developer SDK that they have out. Uh, so I believe that's going to be out here in December of this year. What was that called again? It's called Efinity. Oh, Efinity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Gods and Chain themselves are actually working on their own Immutable X, which is kind of like a hybrid NFT exchange solution that also deals with those same, you know, scalability solutions in Ethereum as it is now. Now, obviously, once we get to 2.0, whenever that may be, <laughs> uh, that may be that may change a little bit different. But then you look at uh, other blockchains like Wax, uh, who have you know essentially taken EOS.io technology and created their own blockchain with it. And you have Instant, and you know pretty much, I mean, you can put thumbs down, man. But you know they're working right now; they're crushing it right now. So as much as you want thumbs down, this EOS massive volume through their network. They've had multiple. Uh, large IPs come on board uh, that have sold out within an hour or even, you know, even sometimes even less than that. Uh, and, you know, the the trading and back and forth uh, has been amazing. And, you know, you can, it, like what we were talking about earlier about, you know, engine backing with assets uh, through their new Atomic uh, protocol, you can also back your assets or your NFTs on WAX using, uh, you know, at WAX tokens as well. So, uh, you know, we, we've seen a lot of really great progress, I think, with that, with that blockchain in general and the direction they're going. Uh, right now, obviously, Wax is a little bit more focused on collectibles versus on games. But there are games that are being built on Wax. One of the ones that's coming up pretty soon is called Cogs, uh, which I think is going to be pretty cool. It's kind of like a throwback to the 90s Pogs era. Uh, if you guys are around for that or, or, or know what's up with Pogs, but uh, they, they've actually, uh, they, that's actually a fully on-chain game. And every action, every part of that game is actually on chain. 
So everything that you do, everything you're seeing is, is being done on chain. And you can do that on WAX because of the speed and transactions and uh, the fact that there's you know, zero transaction fees and it's incredibly fast. So, so there's a lot of solutions out there. And you know, a lot of people always say, every time I bring up the issue, and I've done videos on this, and I've talked to my community countless times about this, and they always say, well, what, what can we, what, you know, I say, well, what can we do about this, guys? What can we do about Ethereum's fees right now? Because there's so many games built on this that people love. What are we, and everyone just says, oh, go to another blockchain, go to another blockchain, go to a different blockchain. And I mean, you know, that's not as much as they, you want to say that's an easy solution, even if we're, with like smart contract, you know, compatibility, it's really still not that easy of a solution, even for an existing game. Uh, we even saw this with a recent game called Dissolution, which is a pretty large scale uh, space MMO uh, that was on Engine, and they're actually transitioning away from Engine uh, into their own smart contract for Ethereum. But um, it, it is, it's not an easy transition, no matter how you do it, especially if you're already an established game with assets out on the market, uh, it, it, you know, to be able to just jump chains uh, is not the easiest thing. Interoperability is something obviously we need to work on in the space and, and we're getting there. We're getting there. Sure. I want to, I want to jump into QA really quick because people are tossing some really interesting questions. The first one I'll kind of just break the ice with. It's kind of funny and it's a little calling you out Shay, but we'll do it. Do you need a gaming chair to be a pro gamer? <laughs> I saw that question. <laughs> 100. Is, is that a thing? 100. I don't know what you're sitting. If you're a pro gamer and you're not sitting in a gaming style chair, that I I don't know what you're doing, man. Okay, so just just a word of the wise. Uh, I have been. Uh, I, I'm a developer, so I own a web development company. Uh, I've been a tech guy and a gamer for you know a really long time. I spent a lot of hours in my chair in general. And I've tried all the different styles. And to be honest, man, these gaming chairs are the most comfortable and they're the most durable. So if you spend a lot of time in, in your chair, you have to or you want to. Uh, you know, a lot of times these kind of gaming style chairs are actually really useful. We'll put your Amazon affiliate link. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had I don't, man. But, you know, like, I'm How just dare you. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this, though, because we're a gaming company, right? Like, and so when I do screening interviews for the roles that we're hiring for, if you are in a gaming chair and don't say any like red flag answers, like I definitely give you extra points for that because it shows me that you are really interested in the gaming sector and you're not just looking for another job. Right. Hey, noted. That is all you gamers <laughs> out there. Noted. <laughs> Um, okay, so another top rated question. So best blockchain for storing, trading and selling gaming acquired assets like swords, armor, and my rare kyber crystal found on Tatooine. Or what is it? Of course. You are just, you <laughs> just completely credibility uh, whatsoever. <laughs> All right. Next question. <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, I guess out, outside of that last part, what's the best the best blockchain for doing something like that? <laughs> I mean, right now, it's I mean, the best blockchain, the most used one for that right now is Ethereum. I mean, what is really the best right. one? That, that's a hard one to say. Obviously, you know, like I said, there, there's a lot of great things that are emerging right now, and uh, yeah. okay, I'm I'm to, we're still so early. Like, like I don't know. Like, there's there's nothing super you know triple A on a blockchain yet. So I think until we get to that level, yeah. you know. Who's gonna win out? What's gonna win out? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Greg, I'm curious for for from your perspective for this next question because you you incubate a lot of like uh, up and coming early stage startups, right? So, when it comes to regulatory compliance, right, how does that impact the in-game currency and rewards? Um, since there is some type of tangible real world value to what people are purchasing. Well, I think it's it really comes down to the fact that anytime you convert. Um, you know, from crypto to fiat, uh, you know, those bridges bridges have to be accounted for. Um, I think right now with the complexities associated with like play to earn and DeFi, um, there's not any real guidance. You know, I think 2017 with CryptoKitties, the SEC, it, you know, was a little bit of a flag trying to figure out what, you know, what exactly are these things. Um, but right now, NFTs, uh, at least in the current regulatory perspective is, you know, they're considered collectibles. Um, and so I think when we start exploring more and more, um, you know, unique use cases and the scales to be beyond, you know, 20,000 users, essentially, that's when I think, uh, you know, more regulatory, uh, uh, um, interest, uh, will, will, will be, you know, spotlight will be on us a little bit more. 
Um, and so that's definitely stuff we're thinking about. And I think, you know, to have a, have, you know, internal token economies and uh, things like that, I think that's what developers need to be thinking about. You know, you need to treat these just as you were, you know, uh, launching your own blockchain or launching your own uh, DeFi project. Uh, so I think uh, just because it's a game, you know, I think, you know, it doesn't protect you fully, but there's definitely ways you can wrap it to kind of put yourself underneath the, the um, umbrella of, you know, like EA sports and loot boxes and things like that. So I think there's just some creative ways you can approach and, it. And Richard and, and Shay, I see you guys nodding your head here and there. Maybe you can chime in. Either or. You go first, buddy. So the regulatory burden is substantial and I'm not one to talk smack about attorneys, especially we have one with us here. But it I'm is friendly. Interesting. I'm friendly. <laughs> I'm on your side. <laughs> they always say that. Um, <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> oh, okay. We have to drink to that one. <laughs> I kind of love it that when I'm in the game design, like ball pit at, um, at Dapper Labs. Now, I have a background in uh, managing legal projects as well. And attorneys, especially patent and trademark attorneys, are some of my closest friends in the Bay Area. So I I'm happy to work with attorneys. And to me, it shows great wisdom when the CEO hires attorneys at the start of the project, rather than to deal with the problems that the project creates. And so it's great to have attorneys in the room when we're thinking about what we're doing, because the regulatory environment is very uncertain. And of course, much of the value to be created is going to be in legal gray areas. But that does not mean you should not listen to the wise attorneys you have available to you now. And that in general, blockchain gaming, because people can earn money from it, is very different than gaming in general. And it's a great idea to involve a wise, creative, forward-thinking attorneys in the process of game design at the beginning if you think the game has any chance of real money. Now, again, it was mentioned before, if your game is never gonna make any money, nobody's gonna sue you, so it doesn't matter. But if you think your game could scale and really bring in like tens of millions of dollars per year, then it makes a lot of sense to consider the regulatory environment and to have attorneys sitting in the room with you when you're designing. I find it sometimes frustrating because you know people will be like, no, Richard, that, I'm like, oh. <laughs> but at the same time, it's probably better that they tell me at the beginning of the process so I can think of something else and make sure the outer loop is not likely to be considered gambling, even in somewhere like the Netherlands or Belgium. Because there is all sorts of regulation happening right now. And we have to consider that if you want to, you know, go into the blockchain gaming space with crypto, I mean, one of the questions you should ask yourself is, what will Belgium do? Or how will the Netherlands see this? which seems kind of annoying and minor at the time, but Netherlands and Belgium right now are the cutting edge of, of influencing the EU with policies that could be very substantial for how loot boxes in general or any kind of randomized rewards are perceived. You know, and coming from CryptoKitties, randomized, that's like part of our DNA. And in gaming in general, like we're not a casino, but in gaming in general, role-playing games, tactical games, any kind of mid-core, anything game, like randomization, that is core to how games are fun. Right. So we, is so we, need to, we need to clarify what we're doing. We need to go forward with the plan that is actionable and is you know, hopefully going to be legal, given a regulatory environment that we don't even know now that is going to occur in the future. See, but how do you plan for that, right? Because then when you build a, such a global game, you have to take into consideration every single jurisdiction from every single country, right? Assuming you're going to have users from, from all over the world, right? So how do you actually build a system that kind of aligns with all these, different, these, all these different legal systems and whatnot? I mean, ultimately, in the current environment, you cannot take into account yeah, everything. You can't. You can't, you can't. So what's China going to do? Honestly, I don't know because... If anybody says anything about Hong Kong inside your game, you could be doomed. And that, that's a potential problem. No, that's not a fictitious problem. That's like a real problem. So are you going to have chat? If you have chat, all of a sudden, to the more repressive regimes in the world, 
you're a liability and they can come after you for all sorts of different reasons. And so you need to think soberly about like what jurisdictions in the world have sober, clear, consistent courts and what is their economic contribution to your plan. Mm -hmm. And you really, you, you cannot take into account all the world's edge cases in making your game. That's not going to work out for you. You need to pick a, a, a part of the world. Hopefully you're thinking more than just like Americans. I mean, that's a big chunk of the world, but it's not everyone. You can include a lot more people and a lot more jurisdictions without having the naive idea that you're going to solve the problem for all 186 countries in the world and every legal jurisdiction that you encounter is going to be happy. If you make real money, they will not be happy with you. I guarantee it. Especially the more socialist and more repressive regimes are going to find a way to try to either stop you or more likely just take a sizable cut because that's how they operate. Anybody else want to add to that? Or we can go to the next question. A little on top. Oh, no, go ahead, Amy. Go ahead. Well, so to answer your question, Adam, yeah. in most, uh, in, in many areas of law, I think, um, for example, financial services or even certain types of, is it gambling or is it skills based, blah, 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 usually there's a couple of leaders that kind of, you know, they, 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 they put out the regulations they, and then they set the stage for, you know, their jurisdiction. But because they're either a market leader or something like that, a lot of other jurisdictions follow them. That's not the case for everybody. But, um, for example, you know, KYC law, right, or, or sanctions law, like, it's really like sanctions law, for example, it's really the US, the UK, and, you know, a couple Western countries that, you know, write the rules and everyone just kind of like adopts something super similar gdpr which is privacy right like um right now ev everyone who's trying to comply with gdpr or copa it, it's the lowest common denom denominator in all the jurisdictions that are now starting to come out with privacy rules are coming out with ones that kind of like fit into it not 100 percent, but but you know kind of so so usually that'll capture like 80% of, you know, what you're trying to get at, I think. Okay. Good to know. Uh, Che, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, just real quick. Like, so, you know, when it comes to like regulatory environments and, and kind of the history of digital assets, um, digital assets online have been around and been traded for money for like a long, for 20 years already. Uh, I was selling digital gold on eBay in 2001 for the very first MMO that was ever created. Uh, and people have been doing those things since then. And so, you know, we talk about, well, what's the regulatory environment in the United States? Obviously it's, it's you know, fairly unregulatory, uh, un, you know, unregulated because you look at some of these, these game skins that people have got, I mean, there's skins that go for $50,000 uh, on some of these marketplaces and they're not blockchain based items. They're like skins for CSGO or something. Uh, though, those types of items, I, I don't see necessarily regulation going after. It's the randomized loot box type of items that really I think that they would be going after because of the gambling aspect of it. So if you're if you're owning an item in a game or something of that uh, something like that for some sort of action, I don't necessarily see that being a regulatory issue. Um, but it, when it comes down to these randomized things, that's definitely something that has, has come to the forefront, you know, especially here in the United States with games like Fortnite that have become very popular. And then you also see people betting using skins. So they'll bet on matches or other things actually using the in-game skins as a currency for that too. And so those things I could definitely see being regulated. Now, when it comes to like global regulation, that's an incredibly hard thing to do. But when you look at like some of these large scale AAA games that are global based games, uh, a lot of times they'll have specific shards or specific, you know, arms of that company that are aimed just at that demographic. So Korea or some of the, the you know, uh, Eastern uh, countries and then, you know, Western ones, Europe and the United States because of the difference in regulatory bodies. But if you're going to be able to capture those markets, you know, you see major AAA titles being able to do that, but they definitely have to have specific, you know, arms within those things to be able to navigate some of those things, like you said, which are kind of hard to do. But to capture the major markets, uh, major gaming markets, you, you want to be able to, to at least be able to do that if you can, if you're hitting that AAA yeah. uh, status. Okay. I, I largely agree with what you said. The only thing I will add is that I've actually met 
uh, one of the prosecutors from the DOJ who his job specifically is to go after money laundering operations in games and laundry detergent, which I'm like, what? Laundry? Uh, apparently it is like it, it holds a stable value wherever you go. Um, but he's prosecuted cases before in, you know, like people doing stuff on like World of Warcraft, um, because I guess it's easier to launder money on World of Warcraft. I don't know. What's but apparently that's a thing. Yeah. What What's his username? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Could you give us a description? Maybe like a post? <laughs> it's in LA. And like, I met at an attorney event and she's like oh yeah my husband prosecutes this stuff and I was like oh and then I ended up meeting him some time later at like a babysitting like all pair event and yeah we just we talked a lot about crypto and money laundering it was very interesting nice uh, I would yeah. say that a long percentage of people who are like actually legitimately trying to use it to launder money I mean I'm sure there's definitely people out there but I think the general kind of consensus is there's that's probably really low on the totem pole of of money laundering you know usually that's that's referred to like the usd world or fiat world which is where most of that yeah. trillion of dollars are being laundered i don't know if I, I but that's that's a very i want to know i want to i want to meet that guy that's an interesting job it's he you're in long beach he lives 20 minutes from us <laughs> <laughs> we all have, 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 a, have a drink together. there you go um, I've got a question. Maybe, Craig, have you seen any companies? So we're thinking about the regulatory side of things. Um, and uh, I, the thing that, that frustrates the crap out of me is that, like, what Richard is talking about is clearly not not gambling in the sense of, like, gambling. Like, I hate dice games. I hate right. slot machines and shit like that. I would never participate. But I love DGENs, one of our companies who does Ethereum sports betting because it's just a two-sided thing. Like, I can bet 20 bucks. I'm cool with that. And then gaming is a whole different thing. Like what you guys are talking about, it's clearly not not gambling, right? And it shouldn't be regulated in the ways that it might try to be regulated because governments try to, to control certain things and want to, to, whether we agree with their reasoning or not, they, they kind of throw a wet blanket on things. Amy right. doesn't know anything about this coming from the crowdfunding space. Um, but, uh, but what I'm wondering, Craig, it has, the similar way that people are looking at, at DeFi and DAOs and things like that, are anybody looking at creating ga game DAOs or things like that? Because like Ethereum, if we looked at it, you know, objectively would have been major securities fraud, but at a certain point is decentralized enough and you can't unring that bell, right? Well, can we do that with some epic gaming uh, company or something like that, that kind of pushes the limits, but is decentralized. So there nobody's in the same jurisdiction. Yeah, and I think that's what, you know, a lot of early groups are striving towards, um, because at the end of the day, you know, things like loot boxes, airdrops, you know, uh, especially if it's outside of a platform ecosystem, you know, the, the SEC is very clear on their thoughts on, on you know, things like chance and, and airdrops and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. But when you get things like engine and, you know, more recently piling games ecosystem, it gives you a little bit more flexibility in what you can do with actual users that are already signed up um, you know, with a, a framework. Um, but the big movement that's that's coming, and I don't know if it's been mentioned yet, is really that play to earn uh, um, push, where essentially I can earn, you know, whether it's liquid cryptocurrencies or NFT rewards for completing certain tasks within games, whether it's single player or competitive. And uh, what we're starting to see, and what we're trying to promote, is this idea of decentralization, where at the end of the day, you want to be at a point where if the SEC comes a knock, and you can say, "Hey, I, I can't shut this off. You know, this is a this system is self-sufficient. It's sufficiently decentralized." Uh, and obviously, that's that's a, a constantly moving uh, uh, target for uh, for some of these early teams. But I think the more you can kind of adopt the concepts of DeFi. Uh, and bring them into these internal game play to earn type economies, I think that's going to spell a lot of advantages long term. And that's really, you know, a major focus of ours, especially is how can we bridge, uh, you know, the traditional cryptocurrency investor and bring them into the NFT space. So a lot of people today are thinking, hey, how do we get the Fortnite user to come and play my blockchain game? And the reality of it is it's not going to happen. I think the best shot on goal, obviously, is is what Flow and, and what uh, Dapper Labs is doing with like Top Shots. I think you know, that's a huge 
fantastic, you know, uh, use case. But when it comes to like uh, uh, more traditional games that aren't necessarily collectible based, um, it's it's a really big uphill battle that I think a lot of games need to think about creative economies first versus like you know trying to go and and capture the top game on Steam and. and Really, really understanding that as indie game developers, you know, that gives you, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of flexibility as, you know, early adopters of indie games are usually, uh, uh, you know, hardcore and, and want to see you succeed. Um, but this concept of like, you know, blockchain gaming and, and Fortnite and, and you know, uh, uh, Call of Duty, it's, it's not reality. And if you've spoken to any of these major publishers, you'll know that this is not on the radar. And, they, you know, this is... You know, I think it was talked about earlier before I was trying to not break my way into this chat, uh, the internal systems that these, these, these major publishers have publicly traded major publishers have, those are things that will take years to evolve, to adopt new technologies. And so, uh, I think at the end of the day, as indie game developers, you should really own the crowd that you can, you know, can capture. And, and what we're trying to promote is, is that idea of, of how do we get the cryptocurrency investor, cryptocurrency user into the space, get their hands on NFT assets. And I think a big part of that is liquidity. And, and I think things like fractional NFTs, in-game tokens, utility tokens, that's, that's what's going to really make the blockchain gaming space explode. And, you know, with any influx of capital will become, you know, a lot easier to convince mainstream consumers of the, you know, the ultimate adoption. And I think, you know, once we remove web 3.0 wallets and transaction fees and all that nonsense, that's where, you know, then I'd be like, yeah, let's let's go try to get some of these, you know, Fortnite players to come play these games. And um, but at the end of the day, I think you know, a lot of groups have thought about this incorrectly. And I think what we're what we're already seeing, and, and we you know we've got a lot of cool things coming up with some of the the ecosystem teams and and direct investments that we we're supporting, uh, is this this kind of concept of 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 internal economies that leverage both liquid and illiquid NFT uh, uh, type tokens. So I think that's going to be really the, the next logical step for the space. Have you seen anything almost like, uh, somebody's got to make this, somebody's had to have already made this. I couldn't have just thought of this, but like um, like a Uniswap or balancer type of pool, but with NFTs That's, on one side? We are, we are actually doing that ourselves. So okay. essentially we are, we're introducing what are called poly, poly Games Founders Keys. And so these are NFTs that provide lifetime rewards within our ecosystem. Again, it's all about building this third party ecosystem where we can begin to aggregate the users and, and tackle some of this, this fragmentation that we're seeing. And so what we're actually doing is we have a pool of 20,000 of these NFTs, and we're actually going to fractionalize those and allow users to have the ability to fractionalize those to create liquid, what they're called Polyant Games Particles, P, you know, XPGPs as the, the ticker will be called, uh, essentially will help facilitate a number of internal DeFi uh, use cases for our partner games, as well as allow us to provide liquidity pools for uh, these play to earn type utility tokens that, you know, whether it's Axie Infinity or, you know, what have you, you can go and have actual liquid markets to uh, trade those for, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, real cryptocurrencies that are used across different platforms. And so, yeah, uh, that's, you know, that's, you know, in addition, that's on our ecosystem side. That's, that's something that we're definitely thinking about and, and very bullish on. Yeah, because I mean, that that's that's where you get to right liquidity on those tokens. I have 10,000 alarm tokens that i nifted uh, that i um that i minted right like some nfts now if i put them into some kind of pool like that i can put in you know a hundred die or some some small amount and each one is worth you know a, a fraction of a penny but over time it could rebalance and people could decide you know owning the alarm tokens are better and all of a sudden it could be worth more right Right. And I think it's, 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 you know, having that liquidity and that actual, you know, uh, bridge for traditional cryptocurrencies uh, investors to participate in those markets. Again, all in a decentralized way. I think centralized exchanges versus decentralized exchanges, there's a big shift going on in general. Um, but essentially, if you can have these utility tokens that, um, for instance, I'll, I'll keep using the example of Axie Infinity, you know, there's, there's simple love potion, SLP, for example. Uh, you, you win it for completing tasks within games, winning competitive, you know, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, competitive uh, uh, matches. Essentially, you know, if you have a uh, uh, utility like SLP that then you can go and use that to breed your Axie characters, uh, you know, having that dynamic in game allows for, you know, the demand side to really exist because not all players are going to want to go in and, 
and hash away and try to earn these. It's shown today, you know, the, the, the pay to play is a massive market, multi-billion dollar market. And so having that healthy combination of play to earn and pay to play is going to be the future of this. And that's what we're looking to facilitate. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, you play to earn. Imagine like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of like a super common game everyone has on, on their phones or has played in the past. Like my, my son loves to play Pokemon Go. So like you can play it for hours and hours and hours. Um, and uh, the more you play it, the more Pokeballs and crap like that you get. But you could also just go into the store and for 99 cents buy 100 Pokeballs or whatever it is. But why couldn't I take my Pokeballs and put them on an exchange and sell them for a fraction of a penny? Uh, that's it. Yep. That's, I mean, that's it. I mean, that's, that's what we see as the model that every game should be looking to adopt. And, and we're, we're making headway with a number of games and another number of partners. And with our decentralized exchange and our, you know, pilot games and, issued, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, token, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff we're looking at. And I think that's I the bridge you, between uh, DeFi and gaming is is huge i love that i want to help you uh build the the gaming the the nft decks i want to be involved. yeah and we actually have a mass you know i don't, I don't want to do announcements of announcements but we're within 12 hours here uh big big announcement coming out tomorrow morning at 9 a.m eastern standard time in this in this regard so <laughs> can you yeah, uh, I, uh tee it up so a adam do the follow-up uh email for this adam vanished uh uh, I think he's having a connection. Like, wait, no, no. Set, uh, set us up so that Adam can include it in like the follow-up for this. We'll delay the follow-up till tomorrow morning so he can include it and share it with everyone. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Fantastic. Cool. So since Adam is dropping up, oh, crap, we're like 10 minutes past the normal time. Um, so uh, let me see if there's um, – Okay, so you know what? Let's just let's jump into the uh, everybody. Tell us where we can follow you um, uh, and where to go, so that um, everyone can get their plugs in, and then um, let's uh, and then we'll jump into the um, and we'll jump into the chat. And everybody, a actually answer the question. Um, I think we already um, know most people's answers, but. Answer the question when you give us your, your plugs of, do you think that gaming should have its own blockchain? Um, I think I, I know where every one of you guys stand on this, but Amy, you start and let's uh, work our way. And then uh, where can we follow you? Where can we download the games? My answer is yes, absolutely. Of You're course. Um, in terms of where you can find, so you can download us um, from the Google Play Store. Um, you know, just look up the company Bling and we've got four titles out. Um, our website is blingfi.com. And if you want to follow us on social media, we are on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the other ones. And yeah, just come play our games. And we love, we love, you know, interacting with our users. If you guys ever have, uh, issues, we have a great customer support service. Awesome. Uh, Craig, give us uh, your plugs and where to find you. Yeah. So um, my my personal is ek, at Eknar underscore official, E-C-N-A-R underscore official, spelled the right, the normal way. Uh, so that's my personal Twitter. And then uh, at Polyant Games, P-O-L-Y-I-E-N-T Games. Uh, that's Twitter is our, our major place to find all of our news. And we have a Discord and stuff. You can join it. And we actually have our uh, initial discounted sale of our nfts going out next tuesday so what i just described is of interest happy to you know kind of continue that conversation on discord and and be sure because it's uh, very limited uh, in terms of access right now so uh yeah awesome richard hi i'm going to put uh our our newest um project in beta testing is nba top shot so Dapper Labs is happy to announce a partnership with the NBA. And so we're super happy with the uh, adoption of the new product. Uh, and then there's CryptoKitties. Uh, if you don't know CryptoKitties, we are the OG um, NFT trading breeding game. Uh, take a look at CryptoKitties. Um, I'm Ostrogoth on Twitter. Uh, I'm not super active on Twitter, although I have had a Twitter account since 2009. Uh, so maybe I should use it more. Uh, but please take a look at uh, NBA Top Shot and CryptoKitties. And we are on the CryptoKitties page. We'll be announcing our new CryptoKitties product uh, very soon. 
And I, Dapper Labs has multiple things. Buns in the oven right now. And we have Top Shot, more Crypto Kitties, and other things too. So please stay tuned. Uh, we're excited to bring the Flow blockchain to the world. And we believe strongly that by making things several orders of magnitude faster and cheaper, uh, that the Flow blockchain might be the answer to Alan's question. Uh, the, the, the blockchain for gamers. Awesome. Love it. And Shay, last but not least, give us your plugs. So first, I want to say, actually, NBA Top Shot's pretty cool, man. I've been in the beta for that, and I've grabbed a couple packs. You got any Raptors, man? Uh, no, you know, I, so the thing is, sometimes you guys send out these emails, like, like five minutes after the sale starts, and I get it, and I'm like, damn, they're already sold out. So I got one like yesterday. Three <laughs> I like three times, man. So I got to be on top of that, but it's really cool. I love what you guys are doing with that. Um, but yeah, so uh, Crypto Stash, you can go to my website, CryptoStash.com, S-T-A-C-H-E. Uh, I'm on Twitter a bunch, also YouTube, and I have a bunch of great channels on, on Telegram and Discord where you guys can come chat with me about games. I have a whole community. We're talking about them all the time. Uh, put all my links down here in chat so you guys can check it out. Uh, but yeah, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and my website is the place for all the stuff. Uh, and I actually have some pretty cool projects that I'm working on. I didn't even get into any of the projects I'm actually working on, uh, you yeah. know, but in general. I got a lot of stuff uh, going on as well. And I'd uh, love to see you guys in chat on Twitter. Love it. Um, uh, excited to have you guys. Thank you so much for coming. So before I end, um, uh, Crispin just said Discord. I just actually joined Craig's Discord while he was talking from the link on Twitter. But uh, if you guys want to share uh, your favorite Discord, uh, in the chats, uh, some, some people are looking for it. Oh, actually, we keep saying that we're going to create a Discord channel for blockchain and booze. We, we probably should. Uh, uh, cr yes, OK, so let's, let's do that this week. I'm going to connect with some of you. Uh, and uh, I might need some of you. Oh, your Discord oh, come on, man. No Discord? I'm on Discord all the time, but we don't have a Discord chat for this crew. And it's become, we started off Blockchain and Boost thinking it was going to be like a three or four week thing tops. And this is like number 17 or 18. It's yeah. turned into a really, really epic crew. And, um, and so we're, we're stoked to, to meet everyone. So, uh, so we'll, we're going to do something and we'll share it with the crew. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, what I wanted to quickly say is that everybody who's joining us, we're going to go into networking mode. If uh, the speakers can stick around, that would be great. If you can't, we understand too. But make sure the folks, uh, participants among us that are, that are watching in the chat, when we go into uh, networking mode, turn on your camera, turn on your mic. There's buttons on the thing. And you can actually double click on any tables you want to go to and uh and um join us go to the first floor you'll see on the left side there's floors so that we all pile into one floor and so we're not all spread out it's really really cool it's fun have a conversation we never told you about us so really quickly uh if you don't know what i do um, we invest in early stage blockchain companies so if you're two founders with an idea and you haven't launched yet and you're just getting started and you need help contact us if you've started and you're growing contact us send us your deck, reach out to us, bug us. We are very hands-on and we like to be the first check written to companies. So go to drapergorenholm.com, check it out. Um, but uh, you're already on our email list, so we'll bug the crap out of you. Um, thank you so much for the speakers for coming, for the attendees for coming. I really appreciate all of your time. I feel like we need to do a gaming one like every other one didn't catch up because it's one of my favorite topics and I don't do enough in the space. So I'm going to start leaning on some of you uh, a lot more. Um, Craig, I'm going to bug you for sure. Richard, I'm going to check the, the, the NBA top shots. And Amy, I play your games already all the time. And Shay, virtual high five. Thank you so much for coming. When I turn this off right now, we're going to be jumping into, uh, into tables. I hope to see some of you there right now.